Thank you, Amy, for coming to today's community meeting on the five-year consolidated plan and the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. Um, the first meeting that we had was about a month ago and we had other Hawthorne residents attend and we're glad that you were able to make the second one. Um, the point of this meeting is to get resident input uh, with regards to one, the consolidated plan and two, the analysis of impediments. So we'll be going over both of those sections separately. The consolidated plan will give you an overview. What is it? Um, what is the process and the components of it? And then we want to have a little discussion with you and some feedback with regards to the various areas that it may cover. And then we'll talk a little bit about the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. Uh, with us today, we have City of Hawthorne staff you'd like to introduce yourselves. Kimberly Mack, City of Hawthorne, uh, Housing and CDG Programs Manager. Okay. Nice to meet you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm Denise, and I work for the City of Hawthorne Housing Authority as a Section 8 clerk. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> You mean I'm the only the resident, Hawthorne resident here? <laughs> so she actually lives in Hawthorne as well. Yeah. She's a <laughs> and then uh, my name is David Munoz and I work with LDM Associates as a CDBG consultant for the city of Hawthorne um, under the leadership of Miss Kimberly Mack. So here we will discuss the consolidated plan. What do we mean by the consolidated plan? So the consolidated plan is a framework um, that is developed to assist the city in determining what its goals for the next five years will be. As such, it is completed every five years and it provides a strategy or a framework for the housing and community development needs. Once we have developed that document and have a strategy for what it is that we, what issues we would like to tackle for the next five years, then we submit that document to HUD or the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and then they would what be able to- What is the meaning by HUD? HUD is the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And so that's the federal government branch that provides the city um, the grant for community development block grants, which is CDBG, or home investment partnership grants, which is just labeled home. Um, there are a few other grants that are also dished out, such as um, ESG, which is Emergency Solutions Grant, um, which is a homelessness specific grant, amongst other ones that they've given out. Um, those grants are given out on a formula grant basis, so they have an internal formula that they use to determine um, how much each state, each county, and each city will be given. If you're an entitlement community like the city of Hawthorne is, that allocation is automatic, so you don't have to put in a proposal to get those funds. That does, because it's automatic, it does not mean that the level of funding stays the same. As I said, it's based on a formula that HUD kind of determines on their own. Um, the point of the consolidated plan is that it is supposed to create citizen and resident participation. Um, and in part, the reason why it emphasizes citizen participation is because if we are going to decide on a strategy for the next five years, Five years is a long time, and in five years, the city can change a lot. And so as a result, we want to make sure that the steps and actions that we'll be taking over the next five years are something that not only benefit the community and the residents, but that they're actually something that the residents um, took part in and that it was for them. Um, additionally, it becomes a management tool to assess performance and track um, the results. So let's say, as part of our five-year plan, we say we have three goals, right? And so let's say it's homelessness, let's say it's senior services, um, and we can do capital improvement projects like fixing streets. Well, 
we that's great, but how do we measure how far along the process we are? Well, we can set certain metrics. So if we want to assist homelessness or resolve the homelessness issue, uh, we would say we want to assist X amount of homeless people over that five year period. Same thing with senior services. We would like to assist X amount of seniors. Um, and so throughout those five years, we're going to be keeping data on how many individuals or beneficiaries um, have been served. That allows us to you know, figure out, are we doing well in one area? Do we need to pick up our, um, you know, do a little bit better in this other area? Um, so every year we're doing an assessment on, we did really well here, this is working, let's keep doing that. Or this didn't work so well, so let's tweak up the process a little bit so that it functions better in the future. So what are the components of the consolidated plan? There are eight main components. The first is the citizen participation plan. So as part of that document, um, it lays out um, a few things. The first is what is the process going to be with regards to resident input for the, well, this would be the consolidated plan, the action plan, the CAPER, which is the Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report, um, as well as the monitoring plan. And so with those four documents, you know, we need to know how many days in advance do we need to let the residents know that this document is available for their review. Because every single one of these documents, you all should be able to comment on and provide your public feedback. Um, for the citizen participation plan, I believe the one that's currently adopted, it says that the consolidated plan should be available for public review for no less than 30 days. At that time, um, it will then go to city council, and then if city council approves, these documents would be submitted to HUD. So that's kind of what the citizen participation plan lays out. Then we go to the analysis of impediments, um, or the AFH. Um, oh, is it perfect? Let's do it like that. Yeah, perfect. Um, and this section covers impediments to fair housing, and so we'll discuss a little bit what fair house, what is meant by fair housing, and what an impediment to fair housing would be. Um, then these three components right here are what make up the consolidated plan document. So in the needs assessment, we do an assessment of what are the community needs. And so as part of that, we can do certain demographic data, certain socioeconomic data. Um, and so it's an assessment of what type of services are needed, what type of housing um, developments are needed, and what kind of community development needs um, exist within the city. Then after that, we'll move on to the market analysis. And as part of the market analysis, we'll be um, analyzing certain things such as the average rent in Hawthorne, what the average housing price in Hawthorne is. And so once you combine not only the need, but then also what is available in the city, you can then create a strategic plan. And so you see why these two components are a prerequisite for the strategic plan to be made. As a resident, you know, a lot of us have certain needs that are more close to us, you know, because that is your lived experience. However, when you do this analysis, you find out the needs of the community of Hawthorne as a whole and what is possible within the community of Hawthorne. And then you can decide, well, these are the issues that we would like to focus on and how we would like to focus on. Um, after you create the strategic plan, you would get certifications, which is when the city manager certifies that not only he, um, but the staff will abide by the strategic plan and will do their best to implement the plan accordingly. And then you have what is called the action plan. So the consolidated plan, if you recall, is a five-year plan. But as I told you, you know, every year we're going to be tweaking the system. And so that is what the action plan is for. On a yearly basis, the action plan is developed and it lays out what the city is going to be doing 
for that one year. So the program year runs from July 1st through June 30th. So that is one year or one cycle. And so depending on where we are with regards to the strategic plan, that is how we determine how we need to tweak the action plan. So in the example of homelessness, senior citizen issues, and capital improvement projects, right? Let's say the first year we did fantastic on the senior citizen programs. We're not doing so hot on the homelessness issue. Well, we know then at that point that we need to maybe invest more time, some resources into the homelessness activities so that we can meet the benchmarks that we set in the strategic plan for that five years, uh, for the five years. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we stop investing resources in senior programs. It just means that we might tweak it a little so that we may invest a little bit more in homelessness programs. Remember, the goal here is to reach the benchmarks and the metrics that we set in the strategic plan. And so the action plan allows us to reach that. Then finally, we have the monitoring plan. Um, as part of the action plan, we have various activities and programs that we run. Um, but we, as the city, want to ensure that any organization that is carrying out some of these activities on behalf of the city is doing their job properly, documenting that it meets all of the Department of Housing and Urban Development regulations, and ensuring that they are um, you know, running the process as efficiently and as effectively as possible. So the consolidated plan goals, in essence, will be smart. They'll be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And so this is the question, these are the questions that we would be asking ourselves when we are creating the strategic plan. Um, you know, I think everyone wants to, you know, resolve the city's issues like that, but as we know, that's just not the reality of the situation. And so we need to make sure that when we set a goal for ourselves, it's not some idealistic goal, but something that is realistic. Because if we set something that's too grandiose, we'll feel like we can never get that. But if we make gradual progress towards the goals that we set ourselves, then we're truly making an impact. Um, the, the point of this isn't to say that we can't achieve those you know, larger scale idealistic goals, but that instead of trying to eat the whole pie, in one mouthful, we're going to you know, take some slices out of it and eventually we'll get to eating that whole pie. Okay, so the following programs are associated with a consolidated plan. As I mentioned to you earlier, Amy, um, the city receives two grants. It's the Community Development Block Grant and the Home Investment Partnerships Grant. These numbers that you see here are the city's current allocation. So they received 1.3, a little bit over $1.3 million um, for the CDBG program. And they received $562,317 for the home program. Each one of these programs has its own rules and regulations tied to it. Um, in fact, the CDBG program was founded in 1974 and it was a consolidation of eight different programs that existed. There were different rules, regulations, and it just got a little bit too um, convoluted. So what they decided to do, group all of those programs under one house, that was called CDBG now, and they then allowed you to implement various activities. As we were talking about earlier, there are over three pages of eligible activities and projects that could be carried out with those funds. But as you see, we only have a million dollars. So with a million dollars, we can't do three pages worth of activities. And if we tried to, we'd be doing them at a very subpar level. So we need to decide what are we going to do with a million dollars per year? And that's what the strategic plan helps do is we take three pages worth of eligible activities. We shrink it down to one, what is the most necessary in the community? What is the most possible in the community? and then investing those resources in the wisest way possible. So currently, um, it's 
used to fund public service programs such as the teen center, which is actually next door. Um, we've got public facility improvements and infrastructure improvements. So we've got ADA improvements on Prairie. Um, we've got some alley improvements over towards Imperial um, and also at housing rehabilitation programs. Um, as part of the home program, we will have um, housing development as well as housing rehabilitation programs. Um, each one of these programs has different regulations associated with them. This one is geared more towards housing development, acquisition, rehabilitation. This one is a little bit broader in scope. So what I kind of want to do at this point is open this up for that citizen participation. Um, you know, we can look at data and numbers and crunch those all day long, and we could get a decent idea of what we think um, as an outsider would be best for the community. But you all live here, so you all have some insider knowledge that is more useful than the data that we're looking at day in and day out. So there's about eight areas that we're gonna kind of go through, and we'd love to hear um, your opinion on what's doing well in the city of Hawthorne, what could be doing better um, in terms of the quality and the access to these services. Um, so this first one is community facilities. Um, how do we feel about the community facilities in Hawthorne? What is just you know, doing a great job? Um, what could we invest some funds to make better? What are your thoughts on that? Because everything is so important. Yeah, and so, right, and so this is kind of the dilemma that we're faced with, you know, is like all of these things are important and we wish we had more than a million dollars to allocate to all of these things. But the reality of the situation is we only have a million. And so if we had to choose some community facilities, let's say, you know, community centers, do you think that at the very least, the Hawthorne community centers are doing pretty well. And so maybe we can focus on, let's say, healthcare facilities. So that's kind of you know, what, what we're asking. Not necessarily like, are there some that are more important than others? It's more so, given the current state of these facilities in Hawthorne, which ones should we invest our resources in? Healthcare facilities. Healthcare do you, facilities? Do you think that you can pull under you know the clinics, hospital, something like that from the outside of the city and contract with them so they can actually pay the Boca tax, uh, you know, taxes. Mm -hmm. And then you can gain more income for the city. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you know that so many different uh, facilities lay out of the beach area and the Torrance Gardena but I think they want to have more patients that's why they can move into the Hawthorne and then develop of the clinic neither you know that is empty there's a hospital there really? and then they can utilize it and then actually I think if they develop something like that they have to pay property tax or what kind of tax, I don't know. Sure. And that means Hawthorne City can gain some income and then pass it's more convenient to the residents and they can utilize all these facilities. Right, right. But how can you do it? And I don't know. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, so, so we think do healthcare facility what healthcare facilities currently exist in Hawthorne? You see, actually, they have some kind of facility in the Hawthorne Boa, okay. around the Imperial or the Hundred Lady something, and sure. the other one is one in the Hawthorne Boa, close by the Superior Boa. There is another the clinic, and I know another some clinic in the Hawthorne Boulevard and then there is an empty building 
for the hospital for a long, 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 long time. Sure. But how come they cannot attract it and then rebuild it and then have the emergency room, everything? Right, right. Hawthorne doesn't have the emergency room, hospital. Okay. So we're, we're feeling like we could do a little bit better in the healthcare facilities department, get some place with an emergency room, um, provide better services to the residents. Um, anything else on this list kind of piquing your interest? Do you think there's any one of these community facilities that the city is doing a pretty good job on? Fire station and equipment is Fire very important mm -hmm. because, you know, we want to get help as soon as possible when we call them. Right? Okay. So fire stations and equipment definitely shouldn't, um, you know, fall by the wayside, keep them um, in the loop. Um, anything else on here? And like the library, so far up to this point, library is doing a good job. They okay. are very good. Great. But is this the one um, <laughs> right yeah. next to City Hall? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So we like what the library's done so far. They're doing a good job. Want healthcare facilities to maybe boost up a little bit and we want to make sure that our fire stations and equipment stay on par. Okay, I think that's, that's a pretty... And the senior centers. I think we need a good centers. We need a good senior center. And then more programs there. Okay. Even I'm the senior citizen. I hardly go over there, but <clears throat> I went there a couple times. I feel they need to, to do something for the center. Okay, so we want to spruce up the senior center as well. Okay. I think that's it. <laughs> you okay. don't have enough money to do everything. Sure, sure. So last slide we talked about community facilities. Um, and now we'd like to talk a little bit about community services. So as part of the senior center um, that you kind of talked about, you were like, I don't really like to go there because there's not much to do. So it seems like something that's tied is the senior center and the senior activities. Would you agree with that statement? I think so because they have some programs but not enough when you compare the other city. Sure, okay, so we'd like for the senior centers to have more programs, more activities. Um, what about any other community services that are here on this list? I have the question. Yeah. I don't know. It's good or bad. It's about mental health service. Mm -hmm. If you do have the mental health service, will you almost like pull in the mental illness patients into the hospital? That's an interesting question. So the question was, if you have mental health services, do you bring in more individuals with mental health issues? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that because I'd say that a lot of data currently suggests that there's more people with mental health issues that aren't willing to be open about those mental health issues. So when you say bring in more, I'm not sure that you're bringing in people that aren't Hawthorne residents to be serviced in Hawthorne. I think maybe you just provide that service to more Hawthorne residents that maybe didn't feel like they had the adequate services available. Um, so I don't know if it does or does not bring in, you know, people from the surrounding neighborhoods, but I think it certainly does provide those residents within Hawthorne with the, you know, access to those services. And you may think that you're like, well, I didn't know that this many people had mental health issues, therefore, they must not be from around here. And I think that that is something that um, data currently and studies would say, there's just a lot more people that aren't willing to be vocal about the fact that they're dealing with those issues, which may be a reason why mental health services is important, um, you know? But we cannot limit to the health on residents. Absolutely. Because everyone has the right to go to that service. Right. And then it's illegal if you say only for the whole from sick that recipe. Absolutely. So So I guess in, in some I, I couldn't guarantee to you that 
more or less people from the surrounding neighborhoods would be coming to get those services. Um, it's just a question, I think, at that point of whether or not you find those mental health services for Hawthorne residents, you know, valuable enough um, to kind of matter more than maybe a few people from surrounding neighborhoods also coming to get those services. I can't answer that question for you. Um, that's that's a, a resident um, feeling, you know? And so if you find mental health services is something that is important, we can, we definitely love to add that to our list of community services um, that we should maybe do a little bit more research on, analysis, what what are the effects of you know mental health services being provided in other cities? Have they seen an influx of um, individuals from surrounding neighborhoods? And maybe then we'd be able to answer that question a little bit more fully, but I wouldn't want to give you the wrong answer and promise that no, there's nobody that's not a Hawthorne resident that wouldn't want to come to get those services. Um, and then that happens and then, you know, um, so I don't want to oversell it. Um, I'd love to be honest with you, so. Um, that's kind of the re reality of the situation. Will you tell me what is anti-crime programs and legal services? What is it? Yeah, so there's a variety of different anti-crime and legal services programs. Um, with regards to legal services, um, there are certain um, programs such as translation services. Um, so there are certain individuals that may not speak English. Um, but that require legal translation services. Um, so that is one of the um, possible legal services. Um, additionally, just legal counsel, such as getting um, notaries. Um, I know that generally they would charge for that, but there are certain organizations that have a specific day, let's say Thursday, um, where if you come in, they'll notarize any document that you need for free. Um, and it's a certain window, let's say one to four. And so on Thursday, one to four, that organization sitting room is like crazy packed. Um, so that's another option. For anti-crime programs, um, there's a variety of options here as well. Um, you can partner with the police department and create certain programs. Um, there's also, I think most of these end up tying into these types of activities. Um, so, you know, when you look at all of the promotional material for youth activities slash, um, you know, decreasing youth getting involved into crime, you got to keep them busy. You know, if you're here at this community center, you see all of these kids playing basketball, um, you know, soccer outside you gotta keep them busy so that they don't fall into some of those traps. Um, and so I think this is intimately tied to a lot of these activities and other types of community facilities that exist. Um, but we can certainly look into certain, you know, target certain segments of the population if, you know, you think that the youth crime isn't necessarily the area that should be targeted. If you think, you know, there's a different type of crime problem happening in Hawthorne, we'd love to hear that. Um, so that we can then kind of, t you know, tailor the activities that we then end up funding to resolve that issue. Because crime is such a wide, you know, spectrum of things that could be happening. And so because I'm not a resident of Hawthorne, when you say crime that's happening around here, what is it that you're trying to kind of target? And then once we have a better idea of that, then we can kind of maybe move that discussion a little bit further. So is there any thoughts that you have on that? Actually, I just want to have the peaceful resident in Hong Kong. <laughs> sure, sure. What's, what's causing the commotion? No, I just saw the newspaper, heard the news or something like that, and just scary. And then, especially not too long ago, someone was killed in front of the police department. Wow. <laughs> and you can see, you just scared to take a walk. Sure, sure. No, yeah, I, I hear you. Um, 
it's certainly a, a challenge, you know, in, in most communities and certainly in Hawthorne is what I'm finding out. Um, and so we hope that CDBG or CDBG funds would be able to kind of help um, at the very least reduce people from falling into getting involved in that activity in the first place, maybe via some of these youth activities um, and kind of bolster the entire um, strategy to reduce crime. Obviously the CDBG program alone isn't going to you know, solve crime, but the CDBG program in conjunction with a lot of the other city programs, I think can certainly make a dent into some of those issues. Anything else on here that's kind of piquing your interest? No, everything is important. If you don't have the money, that is one. How can Hawthorne, City Hall, all this manager, councilman can generate more income for Hawthorne so they can have the money to spend? Right. Yeah, I mean, in a way, they're fortunate that you know this grant is given by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, so it's not coming out of the city's pocket. Um, it's all being reimbursed by the federal government to help low and moderate income families. Um, and so having extra money that you wouldn't have had is at least better than not having the money at all. And so it's just a matter of using those extra funds in the best possible way. But we still need to generate our own income. Oh, sure, sure. And then maybe if you can attract more auto, you know, the bigger center, and then I believe they pay quite a lot of tax to the city. And then can you attract more? <laughs> no, yeah, I hear you. I mean, that's the question that we're all asking ourselves, right? How do we get some more money in our pockets? Um, but, and you know, I'm sure the city is doing various things that are external to the CDBG and housing programs um, where they're looking at routes to be able to generate certain incomes. I know one of the things with CDBG and home programs, um, as I mentioned earlier, is the housing rehabilitation program. As part of that program, the city will generally give out loans to a resident, low and moderate income resident, to be able to rehabilitate their house. Let's say it's their roof. Average housing stock in Hawthorne, let's say between 550, 600,000, which then means it costs about 12 to 14,000 to repair a roof. So we'll give that resident a $14,000 loan, let's say. You get the whole roof replaced, great. Eventually, based on the length or the time of that loan, that resident will eventually have to pay those $12,000 back. When they do, those funds are then reinvested into some of these um, facilities and services that we're discussing. And so you get the annual allocation, but you also are making a little bit more. So the difference with some of those repayment um, plans that I'm talking to you about is that they're restricted to being used on CDBG or home eligible activities. So it's not like property income tax or property slash income tax, where if a hospital were to come in and they're paying property tax to the city of Hawthorne, the city of Hawthorne can choose to use those funds anywhere. Whereas with these programs, it's kind of a recycling of money. If I give you money for, to rehab your house and then you pay back that loan, I'm going to then use that money to rehab another house. And so it kind of becomes a system that recycles itself. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So let's move on to infrastructure improvements. Um, what are, yes ma'am? You say they make the loan, mm -hmm. they don't have to pay the interest. It's a 0% interest loan, that is correct. And then they have to pay it back. Eventually. But if they did not, what happened? If they do not, in what's like the person passes away or they, you know, pass up on the house, what do you, like if they, what's the scenario in which they don't pay? Like they just decide to bail? If they say, I don't have money. If they file for bankruptcy, then that's a different situation, which depending on the agreement that they sign as part of the loan, 
within the promissory note, it would state kind of what the steps that are to be taken. Um, generally within those notes, it explains various factors. So if you were, if the person who rehabbed that house transferred the property or they sold the property, at that point, that loan is due. Let's say they don't pay back the loan. Then at that moment, interest is charged per year that it's not paid back. At that point, the city can choose to, you know, go after that individual if they, you know, see it fits. Um, generally, the city likes to work with those individuals, see what's going on, bless you, um, see what's going on, what's their situation, and work with them. The goal of these loans isn't to be predatory. It's not, we know you can't pay it back, and then we're just going to charge you interest when you can't pay it back, and then we're going to go after everything you have. Um, and so it's, it's more of a... Um, you know, working relationship rather than just trying to go after them. Where is this fund coming from? The rehab loans? Or the uh -huh. So it comes out of the CDDG or home um, allocation. It's all of these projects, activities that I'm talking to you about coming from CDDG and home. Uh, Not from the city's about general $1 fund. Million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. What can you do? You don't have that money to handle here and here and here, right? <laughs> yeah, we agree with that. And that's kind of why we're having this meeting is that we understand that we can't tackle every single issue that exists in the city of Hawthorne, but we don't think that that means that we should do nothing. And so that is why we need to prioritize certain issues and decide this is one where we're doing, we're way behind, you know? So that needs to go to the top of our list and let's allocate those limited resources that we have to see if we can at least catch up, make the situation less bad. Um, I'm not trying to promise you that it's going to resolve all of these situations and that's why we need to know what are the um, improvements that need to happen um, that are most dire, right? Um, so yes, we agree that a million dollars is not a lot to play with but we do have a million dollars that we wouldn't have had before. So what are we going to do with those million dollars? And so that's what this conversation is kind of helping us recognize is, well, senior centers need to be better. We need some more senior activities. We should think about what the effects of some of those mental health services would be. We need to think about some of the anti-crime programs. What do those look like and what types of um, avenues are we going to use? So these are all now helping us narrow the question that we're asking and then allows us to do a little bit more in-depth research rather than broad research on infrastructure improvements, let's say. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now that we are talking about infrastructure improvements, which ones uh, from this list do we think may, they're all important, but <laughs> of this list, where are we falling behind and we may want the city of Hawthorne to get back to where we think it should be? Will you mind to tell me what are you going to do for the drainage improvement? What do you have to do? So there's various ways in which drainage improvements can happen. So one of the ways is, I know that in Hawthorne, y'all have a lot of alleyways. And the issue is that a lot of those alleyways flood when it rains mm -hmm. and so one way that you can do drainage improvements is you do alleyway improvements and so you make it so that the water will flow to a drain rather than flooding so that is one instance you can also install new drains on the sides of roads into curbs um, so that you also avoid that issue um, and those are generally determined um, by areas that are more flood prone um, because if there's already, you know, main highway where there are already drains, um, there's no point in putting in more. And so it's, you know, determining what areas need it most and then kind of assessing whether or not that is something that's within the budget and, you know, high enough priority. So what is the difference between the water and sewer improvements? So in terms of water and sewer improvements, um, there are certain, there are certain areas that don't even have the sewer. So when I'm talking about drainage improvements, 
we're talking about fixing the alleyways so that it then gets to a sewer or a drainage system. Well, what happens if we fix the alleyways, but there's no drain for it to go to? So that then seems like these two, a project where both of these areas are included, right? Let's fix the alleyways, make sure that there's a drainage type of system where that water then goes to. Because if we take the water out of the alleyways and then just put it onto the streets, you're just moving the flood from one area to the other, but you're not really resolving the flooding issue. And so it's kind of when we would do that whole analysis, we would determine, okay, if we're going to do drainage improvements, we need to make sure that there is a sewer where it goes to. If there's not a sewer, then we need to add the sewer as well. Everything is important. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. I know currently um, the city is funding sidewalk improvements um, to make them ADA accessible, um, which is happening on Prairie. And then, like I said earlier, they're also doing some alley improvements um, up towards Imperial. Um, so these are two areas where the city is already very interested in um, improving. Um, but we just wanted to kind of get, or I guess it would be both of these. See, these two are intimately tied, you know, and so that's the thing with a lot of infrastructure improvements, you'll see that there's a lot of kind of connections with yeah. these. So I just wonder, what do the residents do if they see the sidewalk not in level because the tree, the wood, raise it up almost like this higher than <laughs> the regular one. Sure. What, what can the city do and what can you know the resident do? Because you don't want someone to kick on it and fall in front of your house. Right, right. And that, that's a very valid point. Um, with regards to you know the CDBG programs and home programs at the very least, um, it's done in consultation with a lot of people from the public works department. And so the public works department has kind of like a log of complaints from city residents. And so they then do an assessment of, okay, this is an issue that needs to be fixed, needs to be prioritized. And then, you know, the housing department will work in tandem with the pu public works department and say, hey, okay, we know that you have 10 projects on your list these five not eligible, so now we've narrowed it down to five. Of these five, which ones can we kind of use some of these CDBG dollars to kind of assist you along that process? Because the CDBG funds are great, but you know the city also, general fund, has limited dollars as well that they can spend on a yearly basis. But the combination of the two hopefully allows us to carry out more projects than would have been done before. So I think it's very important for you to bring those concerns up with some of the council members or some of the city staff so that they're made aware of the issue and so that they can add it to their list of projects that need to be taken, that need to be carried out. So special needs services. So we've got centers or services for the disabled, We've got domestic violence services, substance abuse services, homeless shelters and services, HIV AIDS centers and services, and neglected and abused children centers and services. We need all of it. Yeah. Yeah, I know that we had the conversation when you, when you walked in a little bit about homeless shelters and services, and that's definitely, like I said, a hot button issue right now. Um, and no longer something that can just be put on the back burner. Um, so I know that the city um, will be doing a lot of research on homeless shelter services, what the effects of bringing in a shelter are, what the best location for a shelter would be. All of these are questions that we're certainly asking ourselves, but we'd still also like your input with regards to well, is our homeless shelter something that we should still focus on? And if so, do you have any thoughts on where they should be? What type of services should be provided as a part of those shelters? Do you have any thoughts on that? I really don't know because I have to consider about the money 
and consider what you can do. Right. Because said you cannot put too much money for the homeless and then ignore the other important things, right? Right, right. So have someone like you can create some plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's what we're working on. And and also take into consideration, right? It's one million dollars per year. And so we're doing a five year plan. Mm -hmm. So think about you know, and it's hard for us to be like I don't want to wait five years and I totally hear you out, you know? But the thing is, think about five years and multiply that $1.3 million over the five years, right? So if you start thinking about what is it that we can do by 2025? Where do we want the homeless situation to be? So yes, a million dollars, limited funds in one year. But like I said, we're setting performance metrics, which means that we could shift funds Maybe boost them up for one year for homelessness. Let's get closer to our target. We reduce them a little bit less over here, let's say senior services, um, because on the first year of the senior services, we crushed it. We got a new senior center. They're running more programs. We brought in more organizations to have more classes there. So now we can maybe loosen the gas pedal on senior services. We've got them cruising now. Now we shift some more funds into homelessness. So yes, we have a million dollars that are, you know, limited, but over five years, we can shift those amounts around to be able to meet those five year targets. And so for us, we need to know, well, if we're going to do special needs services, are we going to be focusing just on homeless shelters or do we need to focus on a couple of these? And so, you know, it's a balancing act. There's not a science to it. It's really an art and it's just a matter of how far along the process you are on a year by year basis. How can you solve this problem? Yeah, you have some kind of housing or shelter for the homeless. And then later on you find out you actually attract more homeless to move in. How do you handle that? That is the $64,000 question, isn't it? Um, if I had that answer, I'd be uh, the consultant for every city in this area, wouldn't I? Um, <laughs> Well, so that, that is certainly an issue that I think a lot of cities are facing, right? And that's why I think a lot of cities are hesitant to kind of pull the trigger on shelters. Um, I know that in Orange County, they're doing regional shelters. So they're putting one kind of like in the border of Costa Mesa and Newport Beach. And so that'll become like the regional hub. So that's one strategy that they're doing so that not one city is taking the burden of having to, you know, be the shelter place. Um, so that's one strategy, right? And there's various other strategies that cities are kind of looking into to be able to kind of ameliorate this, this issue. The problem is that, you know, all of these are theoretical concepts because there is no shelter right now. So while yes, it is a concern that you could be bringing in homeless individuals, we don't know that it will happen certainly. Um, and these are types of issues that we have to tackle as they occur. Um, the biggest, I think, thing is not allowing us, or not letting our fear of what the bad things could happen to prevent us from doing maybe the right thing. Um, and so maybe homeless shelter directly right here on Hawthorne Boulevard, maybe that's not the best idea, but what if we put it closer to the border of another neighboring city and we work you know, jointly with them and be like, look, let's both make sure that this shelter um, can benefit both of our cities. Um, and we take on the load of resolving this homelessness issue together. Um, because whether we want to realize it or not, yes, homelessness is an issue in Hawthorne, but it is an issue in all of Southern California right now. And so until we all kind of start working together, um, it's not going to get resolved. And if we keep washing our hands of, this, of the issue, um, it's just gonna get worse. Can the federal build a high rise apartment for this homeless, but also train them to go out and work? After they get the income, they have to pay either rent or the price of the apartment, yeah. whatever. So there, there are transitional um, 
shelters and services, and that's one of the eligible types of activities that you can fund with CDBG funds. And what that does is it provides housing for these individuals, um, and it says, let's say you have a month to find a job. After that month, um, you know, you have to keep that job. And so the level of rent that they're paying changes. So let's say the first month it's free. Once you get a job, you pay 30%. And so it's teaching them one, the skills to be able to hold the job and two, um, how to also, you know, financial decision-making and management. Um, and so these supportive homes um, allow them to live there for a certain period of time. And then once they feel that that individual is ready to kind of go back out into society, then they're like, okay, we're gonna find you a spot, we're good, and then just keep finding more people to help. Um, so that is certainly one of the strategies that people are talking about um, that they find is super important with regards to homelessness. You know, is you need to provide these individuals with the tools and the capacity to be able to rejoin society or else you're just setting them up for failure. So that is certainly one of the things that we'd be looking at um, with regards to having a homelessness shelter that also provides some of those supportive services. What are they going to do with the building? You know, the Hawthorne Mall before? Now they leave it empty for how many years? Oh, really? So... Yeah, I'm not sure what the city has planned for it. The city had the plan beforehand. They said, we'll let it open, but turn around. No. Hmm. So when they are open, maybe attract more business. When they do the business, and that means that Hawthorne can generate more income. Yeah, that's funny that you say that because I think the next slide talks about. Ah, uh, well, I was off by one. Um, actually, so clean up of abandoned lots and buildings. So that's maybe step number one to the mall. Um, and then you can also do commercial facade improvements. So after you've cleaned it up, you can kind of rehabilitate the outside, make it look nice again, hopefully attract businesses. Um, and so it's a process. Um, I'm not 100% sure what the city has planned for that lot or for any of those units. So I can't really speak to whether or not, you know, we can do this. Um, but it's certainly something that we can take into consideration and then talk to some of the city staff and be like, hey, is there any ongoing plan for that old mall? If not, would you like to maybe start the discussion for what we could do for that space? Um, but that's a good point. I think we should have a discussion of what, you know, Hawthorne has planned for that mall instead of having it just sitting idly there. So we'll definitely bring that up. Well, tree planning is good. But are they going to take care of it, the city? Yeah. Be I don't think so because they don't trim the tree good enough. When I took a walk, I had to bend down almost 90 degrees to pass. Mm, interesting. The where just dropped it like Where, that. where? Um, I is could that? not remember, but I know it's uh, around this area in Hong Kong. Gotcha. Okay, well, we'll, so, yeah, vegetation, overgrown vegetation, definitely. It's good and bad. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, and then plus another thing is the root. The root, The right. street, the sidewalk. Right, I think nowadays, you know, um, the city is better at assessing which types of trees and plants um, are better suited, number one, for the weather and the climate, Number two is recognizing the type of growth that it has um, to prevent some of the sidewalk issues that you're just talking about. Um, and then third is maintenance. I think cities are becoming better at recognizing the limited resources that they have for maintenance of vegetation. And so they're trying to choose vegetation that requires less maintenance maybe, um, less water even so that it's not um, using up all of the city's water supply, et cetera. Um, so I think right now that a lot of these, you know, conservation um, discussions are happening, that's also forced the city to kind of reassess what type of vegetation they're gonna be planting. Um, and so 
I think that should hopefully, you know, if tree planting were something that the city decided to focus on, that's certainly something that we take into consideration is making sure that if we were to plant trees, let's try and minimize the risk that a negative effect will come from it. So we'll certainly take that into consideration. I don't want to say the location, mm -hmm. but I saw that one gardener was cutting the tree on the sidewalk. I said, wait a minute. I asked him, you don't mean you don't call the city hall or call, you know, the recreation department to do it because this is belongs to their job. And what he told me, the owner called everywhere many, many times for six months. No wow. one came and do it. Wow. So that's why he did it. Hmm. Well, that's unfortunate, um, and we'll definitely bring that up um, so that we can make sure that we're addressing some of those issues and complaints from the residents. And that was surprising. Yeah, no, that is surprising. That I yeah. Said, Wait a minute. I, I hear you. I was nosy. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, I mean, you know. Um, but we like to hear some of these things as well um, because it's feedback for us. There's always room for improvement. There is no perfect system. And so it's when we hear it from you all that, you know, we go back, roll up our sleeves, and we're like, okay, we need to fix some of these things. Um, and there's just so many things going on on any given day that sometimes we lose sight of that one call. Not to say that that one call isn't important because we do take all of these calls very seriously. Um, there's just a lot going on all the time. And so sometimes we just need to have that moment in this conversation with you so that we can recenter and be like, okay, we need to make sure to stay on top of these things and be better about it in the future. So we appreciate that. So businesses and jobs, this kind of ties into the mall discussion that you were talking about. Um, so commercial facade improvements, as I said, um, I know that in the last community meeting, they were talking about improving the facades of a lot of businesses on Hawthorne Boulevard um, to hopefully attract more individuals who are driving through Hawthorne Boulevard to go into those businesses. Um, you've also got employment training, job creation and retention. Those two are somewhat intimately tied um, with regards to, you know, if we're going to, let's say, do a mall project, well, who can work at that mall? Um, are we going to provide training for individuals to be able to work at that mall? Things like that. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind some of these activities. So where do you think, in terms of priority, I know, you know, we've got a mall, let's say. What, where do we need to start this mall process? You know, we have the two medium size of the hotel in Hawthorne Boulevard. Mm -hmm. If they can open the mall as before, then they will attract more people to stay in this hotel because for the convenience. Right. And, but are they in the good business now for these two hotels? I wouldn't be able to tell you. I don't know how the hotels are doing. And then I think another thing is we need to really clean up the Hawthorne Boulevard and do more of the good things so attract the business people to look at it. They will look at it and find out can they make the money here? Right. Because they will not develop the business if they will lose money. Right. So that means we have to create something Sure, to sure. attract the businessmen, you know, to do something. Okay. So for the training, I, definitely, we need to train the people how to do, do their job. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm hearing let's improve some Hawthorne Boulevard, attract businesses, um, make people feel like they can make money here. Mm -hmm. Employment training, we need to make sure that if we do make these business people come in that they have human capital to be able to fill those positions, which means that they need to be qualified for the jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of falls in here. 
Um, okay. Perfect. So we've got some businesses and jobs and ideas about that. Now we've got some affordable housing services. So we've got housing rehab, which was the program that we were talking about before to replace um, the roof. Um, we've got assistance to purchase a home, fair housing discrimination, lead-based paint removal, and energy efficient improvements. How do we feel about affordable housing services in Hawthorne? I think that is quite good to be noted. Actually, I want to ask you, mm -hmm. how do you do the assistance to purchase a home? Okay, so the question was, how do we do the assistance to purchase a home? So, in the past three years, um, the city has funded what's called the First Time Home Buyer Program. And so what that is, is um, any resident from Hawthorne can submit an application as well as the supporting documentation required um, to verify that they're eligible to receive that assistance. And in the event that they are eligible, the city would provide them with a loan to cover um, you know, let's say the, more, the first part of the mortgage fees as well as putting a down payment for that home. Um, they don't have to pay back? The eventually, no, I don't believe they do. There are different, and this, like I said, there's different requirements for different, um, you know, loans that are given out by the city. Um, so there are certain housing rehab loans that are interest, or that would require higher or lower interest based on after a certain period of time. Same thing with the first time home buyers. Um, it's on a case by case basis. However, one thing to note is if you saw the action plan for this year, um, the city is no longer doing the assistance to purchase a home program. And here's why. So the city currently has housing stock, which is running at average five, five, five fifty to 600,000, right? And so in order for the first time home buyer to work or that activity to work, on average, that loan would be $250,000, right? And so the first time home buyer program generally falls under home. So if you recall under home, the city's getting $560,000 more or less. So in order to assist one family to purchase a home, you basically spent half of your grant. And so this again goes back to the conversation of with the limited resources that we have, how are we going to you know, use them? And if you find that, you know, that is still some useful, it is still a useful activity, then we'll certainly reintroduce that. Um, I think the logic behind kind of pulling away from that was twofold. One is we are finding that a lot of the applications were just being denied. On an average, I think in the past three years, there's maybe been one or two applicants that have passed the eligibility review out of 20 to 25. So it is somewhat of a rigorous application process. Um, so that was hurdle number one. And then hurdle number two was we would like to broaden the scope of, you know, increase the number of people that we serve with these limited dollars. And so instead of helping one person and giving them a $250,000 check to buy a home, we'd rather use those $250,000 to let's say rehab various people's homes. Does that make sense? Not to say that the first time home buyer program isn't a good program. We'd love for people to start being able to purchase a home which people from my generation, we're not sure if we'll ever be able to do that. So that is certainly an issue that we're facing. Um, and it's not something that, you know, we should take lightly. So I'm not saying that the current strategy is what we have to stick with. And so if you still think that assistance to purchase a home should be something that Hawthorne prioritizes, we'd love to hear that feedback. And we'll definitely take that into consideration when kind of crafting that strategic plan. No, I just want to find out how do you handle that program? Yeah, I think that's generally the way it's been run. Um, and like I said, because of the application process being so rigorous, um, it's been difficult to kind of find ways to make it happen. 
Um, and so you're just sometimes waiting a whole year. Like all of last year, we had allocated $250,000 for the first time home buyer program and not a single applicant passed the application process. And so- How can they pass it? So there's, in the application, there's various forms of documentation that need to be submitted um, based on your income, bank statements, credit, et cetera. And so, yes, the city wants to issue you a loan, let's say $250,000 to be able to get into that house. The city does not, however, want to give you a loan for $250,000 if you can't prove that you're at least making enough income to be able to pay the mortgage on a monthly basis. They don't want to give out a $250,000 loan for you to then foreclose on that property. And it's only for the first five years. Yes, it has to be the first, first time that you're buying a home. So how do you handle the fair housing discrimination? What is it? So it's funny that you asked that because in a couple slides we're going to talk about fair housing um, discrimination, but currently the city provides the Housing Rights Center $30,000 to be able to provide fair housing services. And so what that entails, it can be landlord tenant counseling or handling any fair housing discrimination cases. So if you are, let's say a renter and you feel like the broker, um, the landlord or is kind of, you know, acting in discriminatory ways and that is based on like protected classes, um, then you would go to the Housing Rights Center, provide them with, you know, a little background on your situation and then they'll provide you some information or guide you in the direction of this is what you need to do. Or if it's serious enough, they'll open a case for you and do some of that investigation for you and then you know, help you along the way on what steps need to be taken to kind of um, resolve the situation that you're in. So the Housing Rights Center, we also have their contact information at the end of this slide. Um, they're located on Wilshire um, in Los Angeles, but they provide services for Hawthorne residents. So can you tell me the, what it is for the other two programs? The lead-based paint and energy efficient improvements? Mm -hmm. So for the lead-based paint removal, um, in any house after 1978, I wanna say? Yeah, that sounds about right. 1978, um, so any house built before 1978, more likely than not, um, has lead-based paint. And so what that means is if the city were to rehab a house, that was built before 1978, they will be required to also do lead-based paint removal. And so they have to go in, um, kind of do a lead-based paint abatement, and then repaint the house with non-lead-based paint. Um, it's just more of a safety hazard, and in the situation where they rehab the house, they'd be required at that point to uh, remove that lead-based paint. So you mean they are going to take some paint and then test it? Yeah, there's various tests and then they would do an abatement and then they would repaint. And then for energy efficient improvements, um, there's various energy efficient improvements. So one is double pane windows to be able to um, conserve, you know, cool air inside from, from getting out, as well as the heat getting in. Um, you can do light fixtures. Um, if you're doing, let's see, generally as a rule of thumb, it has to be part of the structure, but as a result of some of these energy efficient improvements, you could sometimes do, let's say a stove um, that's actually built in rather than one that they can just take out, um, a washing machine, um, dishwasher, things of that nature. The, the key here though is that when they're doing rehabs that include energy efficient improvements, it, the rule of thumb is generally that it has to be um, necessary to the structure or structural integrity of it. Um, the reason why I say that you know certain things like energy efficient washers um, and things of that nature are now allowable um, is because now they have the stoves that are actually part of the counter, if that makes sense. And so it's not something that somebody could just take and then resell. Um, that's kind of the rule of thumb, but it's you know, a determination that's made on a case-by-case -case basis. So that means housing we have, including the lead-based paint remover and energy efficiency. That is correct. Yep. 
And but not every rehab includes these two, if that makes sense. So some rehabs can include them, but not all rehabs do. Some, some homes are built after 1978, more, well, so 1978 was when the rule or the law went into effect. They gave like a grace period for a year, which generally means, you know, we'll take 1980 and forward, you know, homes built after 1980 that probably were not using lead-based paint. So let's talk about affordable housing facilities rather than services now. So we've got housing for disabled, senior housing, single family housing, large family housing, affordable rental housing, and then transitional and supportive housing, which we talked about when we were discussing the homelessness issue. Which one of these affordable housing facilities do we uh, think maybe Hawthorne is doing a good job with? Um, which ones could we do, you know, maybe use some help on? Will you mind to give me a little bit of background? Uh -huh. Sure, so housing for the disabled. Um, one example is a disabilities um, type of complex. And so in those complexes, they can provide supportive services for those individuals um, and have them on site. Um, sometimes it could range for, I know there's a program called, or an organization called HOPE, um, which has some of these um, dis housing for the disabled facilities. Um, and one of them even ranges for a college preparatory housing complex for disabled youth. Um, and so it prepares them for college and even becomes a space for them to live while they're in college. Um, and it provides them with some of the services that they need while they're maybe away from home. Um, then you've got senior housing, um, which are generally senior only housing complexes um, for the purpose of CDBG, the age is 62. Then we've got single family housing, pretty self-explanatory, not affordable, like it's not a com an apartment complex, but it's more of a home for a single family. When we say large family housing, this means that the family, so single family, one to four, large family, five and above. So that's kind of the distinction with the difference here. And then you for that five bedroom. Five people. Five people. Um, then um, five people or five unit. Um, then we've got affordable rental housing. Um, these are more of your apartment complexes, Section 8 complexes, etc. And then we've got transitional and supportive housing. So these can take the form, different forms. So some of these are for homeless individuals, as we discussed previously. Some of them are for individuals battling addiction. Um, some of these could be for victims of domestic abuse. And so the use range it has you know a wide range of um, possibilities um, and so depending on some of your answers to some of the previous questions in terms of maybe you know which low and moderate income groups need the most help currently in the city of Hawthorne that may be kind of how we tailor the transitional and supportive housing what facility control all this program in terms where, of you know, the people can get help. How can they get help? So are you asking how do individuals find out about, like, mm -hmm. let's say if we were to start a transitional and supportive housing program? Mm -hmm. So there's various ways. Um, the first is under the home program, you can have community um, housing development organizations, or a CHODO. And what that does is it brings in an external housing development organization who, for instance, could build housing for the disabled. And they would be kind of managing that whole operation. The city's job at that point would be to, you know, monitor their activity. And so we would check up on them, making sure that the individuals that are living in those homes are eligible applicants, that you know, they're using the funds in the correct way um, and that they're implementing that program in the most efficient manner possible. 
So it could range from you know, different organizations that are going to be carrying out these activities. And those organizations generally have um, marketing strategies in place and outreach efforts and case managers that are kind of bringing in some of these individuals to be a part of these affordable housing facilities. I don't know how to choose this one because I'm thinking each program has pro and con. Yeah. So that's why I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and that's, that's the thing here is with anything, any type of change has pros and cons. Um, and that's just, the reality of the situation it's just a matter of if the pros if the pros in your mind outweigh the cons um, because no matter what you do there's going to be pros and cons and doing nothing also has pros and cons and so it's just having to weigh whether or not the pros outweigh the cons because there's going to be cons inevitably but can we make pros out of it so, okay, so we need to maybe do a little bit more research on affordable housing facilities and maybe what the need in Hawthorne is. Because we find all of them important, but maybe we find that there's not enough senior housing for the senior population that exists in, in Hawthorne. And so we'll do some more research on that and hopefully um, get some more citizen input um, with regards to where we're lacking. So what are the next steps to kind of get this process rolling? The first is to finalize the needs assessment and market analysis, which we've been working on for the past couple of months. Then it's to establish that strategic plan. So after we've done a needs assessment, we figure out, okay, this is where Hawthorne currently is. Who, where do the low and moderate income people live? Um, which ones are cost burdened, i.e. they're using um, more percent of their income or a higher percentage of their income just to pay for rent than others. Um, what is available in terms of resources in the city and housing stock? And then we would establish, you know, number one is the areas that we want to focus on and the goals that we will have for the next five years, which is our strategic plan. Then we will publish the draft consolidated plan. That consolidated draft, plan draft, will be available for public review and comment for 30 days. At the end of those 30 days, we'll have a public hearing at a city council meeting. And by the way, we will publish a public notice for you know, letting residents know, by the way, this is now available to you all to review, comment on it, let us know how you think we can maybe improve it or any good things that you think came out of this. Then we'll have that public hearing at the city council meeting. If the city council approves it, then we will submit that plan to HUD. You know, the word, I'm thinking, I'm not looking down the low income people. I'm thinking about affordable rent to the apartment or houses. Will it affect the people own houses cannot sell their house as the neighborhood, the city has much more higher price. So they will not come in to buy the houses in Hawthorne. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of market forces at play there. Um, I know if you talk to any real estate person, they'll tell you the three rules are location, location, location. Mm -hmm. and. Hawthorne seems like it's in a great location. There's a lot of history here, You're right by the airport. Housing stock here is, you know, already very pricey. Um, and so I don't know if adding more affordable rental housing necessarily decreases the stock for the entirety of Hawthorne. Um, I, don't, I can't say that it will, I can't say that it won't. Um, and so, that's certainly something to take into consideration. The other thing to take into consideration is also where those affordable housing units would be located in, with respect to you know, maybe where your house is located. Um, because where I'm from, if you, you know, the north and the south side, totally different. If there's more affordable housing on the south side, it doesn't affect 
the housing crisis of the homes in the north side. Um, so while adding you know more affordable housing may be a detriment to the south side, if there's already affordable housing there, how much does it impact it? Now, if you were to put an affordable housing project on the north side, how does it affect housing prices? I'm not sure. Um, and that's certainly something that I think the city would be cognizant of. Um, and you know that's why we have some of the resident comment period for a lot of these plans. Before we even start you know, putting this whole thing into action, we give you all a chance to voice your concerns. So it's not like, okay, behind closed doors, boom, affordable housing units, they're going up. And then it's like, now that they're built, now you have a chance to respond. No, no, no. Before we even start construction, you're gonna get a chance to make your voice heard and make sure that we take all those you know, um, issues into consideration before we start. We'd rather correct the issue before it happens rather than try and play fix up after. Um, so we'll definitely take a lot of those things into consideration and hope that it's a solution that works for everybody involved. What cause the houses are more expensive like for example, Manhattan Beach, uh, Segundo, and the Torrance, and all of these are PV, all of them is much, much double, triple, four times than the Hawthorne houses. Mm -hmm. So what caused their houses so expensive? Uh, well, like I said, location. And number two is probably just the age of the housing stock. Um, Hawthorne, you're paying $600,000 for slightly older housing stock, um, generally, um, versus Manhattan Beach, where a lot of that housing stock is very new. I also think, you know, there's so many factors at play here um, that I couldn't possibly, you know, dial that in in about five minutes. Um, and so, the, you know, it's a tough, tough question to answer because there are a lot of factors at play. Um, I'm, I don't know how much the housing stock in Hawthorne has gone up, let's say five years ago. Do we have a kind of a number? Because the average income certainly goes up. Um, and I know average rent goes up. But if you've noticed after the collapse of 2008, housing prices have gradually, you know, depressed whereas rent has gradually increased, um, which is kind of an interesting change that we've seen um, and we haven't seen in a while. And the reason for that is because people don't feel like they can afford a home. And so everyone's jacking up rent prices um, and the price, because nobody's, not as many people are buying homes, um, it's not causing that same increase in the value for homes. So that's one of the things that we've been seeing in some of the market analysis work that we've been doing. So, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of factors at play. Yes, location, but yes, there was also an economic crisis that's caused individuals to have to change the way that they live. They're now renting rather than buying, and how long are they renting for, and where are they renting? Um, and so who are the individuals that are buying and where are they choosing to live? Oh, they want to live on the beach. And so it's like, you know, there's so many things that could go into that analysis. And so I couldn't really tell you why other cities' housing stock prices are going up maybe at a more rapid rate than Hawthorne's are. So the second component of this is just going to be the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. Um, this will be pretty quick. There's just three slides. So the city does an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice, um, and it's used to be able to improve equal housing opportunities for all residents. Um, so there's two main things for um, the analysis of impediments. It's a study of actions, omissions, or decisions that restrict housing choices or the availability of housing choices or that have the effect of restricting choice or availability. So it's gotta be one of those two things. It either directly restricts or it has the effect of restricting. Um, this analysis then becomes a report um, that includes recommended actions that should be taken over the next five years and it's in conjunction with the consolidated plan. 
So there's two main things that I think are important to be able to kind of put this together. Number one is to answer the question, what is fair housing, which you kind of asked earlier. And the second thing is once you know what fair housing is, what is an impediment to it? So fair housing is, yay, thanks. Um, no, you're good. Um, oh, yep, go back one. There we go. So what is fair housing? It is a condition in which individuals and families of similar income levels in the same housing market have a light range of choices available to them regardless of protected class. So this is the federal and state law defined protected classes. So if you fall under any one of these categories, you should have an equal opportunity to buy the same house. Does that make sense? Your eyes just widened up. Is there, what's, what's, what's happening? How can they do it? So that's a very good question. It's a difficult situation to kind of navigate, um, but there are a lot of fair housing um, organizations that work on behalf of tenants that feel that they've been discriminated against. Um, so if you go to the Orange County area, you've got the Fair Housing Foundation. Los Angeles, you've got Housing Rights Center. If you go to the inland areas, you've got Inland Housing or Inland Fair Housing Mediation Board. Um, so there's various organizations that take in all of these calls um, and then assess whether or not it was an impediment to fair housing choice. And if it was, they will do some investigation and then it could even get into a legal matter. So everyone, based on their protected class, should have an equal opportunity. So an impediment to that would be any action, decision, or omission that restricts that individual's ability um, to get that same house or has the effect of restricting. So in the last one, we had a question about what is an example of having the effect of restricting. So restricting is generally you know, the landlord choosing one person over another based on the fact that they belong to one of those protected classes. For having the effect of restricting, it generally is a public policy. So let's say there are certain zoning laws or ordinances um, that then have the effect of restricting those individuals that fall under protected classes' ability to be able to get that house. Um, the protection covers financing, offering for sale, rental, or occupancy of housing in the city. Um, any questions on that? I know the way that it was actually broken down to me that it then made a lot more sense is the assessment of fair housing choice is used to basically, it's kind of like a affirmative action with colleges. So in the last meeting, we also got a question, well, what if, uh, what about senior housing? How does that not restrict? So it does, but because it's promoting one of the protected classes, it's okay. As long as you're promoting one of those protected classes, not to the detriment of another protected class. So it's all about protection of those individuals that fall under one of those protected classes. And if you're promoting one of the protected classes, then it's not an impediment to fair housing choice. I just heard the news this morning and talk about the governor just signed this one law. It will affect on January next year. And the homeowner can build additional houses beside or behind. Density know, bonus? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And then plus there is a restriction of the rent no more than 7.5% or whatever I've got. But how will this law affect the whole thing? I can't, I guess I'd have to do a little bit more research, number one, on this law that was just signed today. Um, if it's more of a zoning ordinance where individuals can add additional dwelling units on their property, um, I think that's more of a decision of the property owner rather than a city decision. Um, although the city can implement certain public policies um, to kind of 
guide or create a framework for how those um, additional dwelling units or ADUs would have to be used, et cetera. Um, in terms of rent control, um, that is more also an issue that falls on the individual that is using that property for rent. Um, because it is a state law, there's only so much that the city can do to, you know, kind of shape that public policy area. Um, with regards to how you think it'll affect Hawthorne, in what ways do you believe that it might affect Hawthorne? Maybe we can kind of start that conversation so that when we do have this conversation at the city, we kind of can start the conversation from the point of those concerns rather than just shooting things in the dark, if that makes sense. And so that's the thing that's also difficult is like, there's so many ways that we can think about the ways that it will end up impacting the community, but come January 1st when the law become, you know, is enacted, um, I think we'll start seeing some of these things. And I know that it's frustrating because we want to be proactive rather than reactive to a lot of the effects that these laws will have. Um, but sometimes it is very difficult to predict the way that it will affect the city in particular. And the last thing that we want to do is predict that this is the effect it's going to have, take precautionary measures against that, and then realize that that is not even the effect that it was going to have, and in fact it had this different effect, and now we're reacting to this other issue that we didn't even consider. Um, so, like I said, if you have any specific concerns, we definitely want to take that into consideration because we want to create this laundry list where it's like these are all the possible effects that we can think up um, and then maybe have a game plan for those. Um, we can think about it all we want and you know hopefully we can predict as many of these possibilities as possible that are you know that may happen um, but there are some things that are just out of our control or out of our foresight and that sometimes do just end up happening and you have to react rather than be proactive. Um, and hopefully at that moment we can kind of um, figure out what the best option to do in that situation is. Unfortunately as well, um, CDBG and home funds are used to you know, have certain programs and eligible activities that help low and moderate income individuals. And so some of these questions, while valid questions, are you know certain issues that the CDBG and home programs can't necessarily tackle head on, um, and so that's more of a citywide discussion rather than a CDBG and home discussion. If that makes sense. So for the scope of analysis for the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. There's three main profiles that we create. One is a community profile, so we take demographics, socioeconomic background, um, and accessibility to public facilities, jobs, et cetera. Then we do a fair housing profile. So how many complaints did the city get this year? Did, were any of those found to be violating fair housing choice? Um, how many suits were then filed? Um, how many of them were resolved and how were they resolved? Um, once we get that analysis, uh, we're able to determine what the trends and the patterns in the city are. And so once we can develop that, then we do an impediment profile um, so that we can see, well, which one of these were most prevalent in the city? And then what are we going to do over the next five years to kind of prevent, um, you know, bad mortgage lending practices or public policies that create impediments or have the effect of restricting that fair housing choice. So we want your opinion. Um, if you haven't already, it would be great to take the survey. Um, we have both English and Spanish. Here's the fair housing organization. Um, the city contact information is below. Um, it's pretty simple. All you, if you have an iPhone, all you have to do is open the camera, point it at the QR code, boom, and then it pops up, and then now I have the survey on my phone as soon as the service gets better. 
Oh, there it is. Um, and so it's pretty simple. Um, what it's available on the internet at this URL, or you can take a picture of the QR code. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback. Obviously, we're super happy that you joined us, Amy. Um, this was super insightful for us. And um, for anybody, you know, tell your family, friends that are Hawthorne residents or your neighbors, um, we'd also love to hear their thoughts and some of their concerns as well. Um, I think that just about wraps it up. Um, Miss Max information is on the next slide. Um, she's the um, housing manager, CBG programs manager as well. Um, Miss Esther Luis, who is also working with me um, at the city of Hawthorne, um, can also be reached at that number. Um, we're here for you all, so please let us know how we can be of assistance. Um, we're here to help and try and make the community the community that you want it to be, or the one of good neighbors, right? Is what I hear. Oh.